Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listeners, to episode 26 of the Ad Nauseam podcast. My name is Jeff Winkle, and I am here down in the vomitorium with my good friend and co-host, Dave Noe. How you doing, Dave? I'm doing great, Jeff. So glad to be here. Yeah, it's bone-chilling outside. Uh, we had a little bit of a warm-up. I think it break 20 today? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We got a thaw coming. It's yeah, coming. It's coming. Yeah. It's coming. It's still, it's, it's still pretty cold. I'm glad to be inside the vomitorium. I am, too. And we got a shout-out, don't we? We do. And the shout-out this episode goes to... Uh, Kelly Hastings of Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville. Yes, uh, where it's uh, nice and very balmy down there. That's my today. understanding. And yep. you also told me something else that I thought was really interesting about Ms. Hastings. Why don't you share that? Well, uh, she's a longtime friend of mine. We've been friends for about 30 years now. She's listened to the podcast. Uh, she's told me that she her favorite thing about the podcast is actually the ads. Really? Yeah. What does she think about the rest <laughs> of the content? She just skips right through she's it a, to get to the ads? She says it's okay. Okay. She says it's okay. No, but she's uh, someone I deeply admire. She's a, a lifelong learner. She's very curious. I mean, she's not a classicist. But, okay. Um, That's she, forgivable. It, it is forgivable. But she loves, to, she loves to learn. She loves to engage new ideas. Um, she took uh, me to task, particularly in the Bruegel episode, for apparently I, I was overly confident in um, interpreting partridge body language. Really? Yeah. So she said, come on. Huh. Who are you kidding? Right, right. right. So, I, I th- yeah, probably rightly so. Okay. But, well, hello, uh, Kelly. Thank you so much for yes. listening. Yes. Uh, he, and you have an open quote for us. Today. I do. This is from a man named Charles Siegel uh, in his work, his essay, Divine Justice in the Odyssey. This is from 1992. He says, the Cyclops episode, however, raises serious problems for divine justice. On the one hand, the Cyclopes, quote, trust to the immortal gods, who seem in fact to look after them, for their untilled and unplowed land bears grain and grapes, and Zeus's reign makes increase for them. On the other hand, they are overweening and without laws. If the gods are the guardians of righteous behavior, why do they shower such abundance on these arrogantly behaving Cyclopes? As the poet calls them at the beginning of the Phaeacian episode, the narrative of Polyphemus explores this contradiction and at least partially resolves it by showing that the Cyclopes trust in the gods is misplaced, at least in the case of the signal example of Cyclopean hubris, Polyphemus. So Jeff, what do you think Professor Siegel is saying here about hubris and divine justice? Well, the thing that jumps out at me about is how it complicates it, the Cyclops scene. Certainly when I was a kid, and I think the first time I read the Odyssey in high school, we focused a lot on the Cyclops scene. And it was always taught to me that kind of Cyclops bad guy, Odysseus good guy, Cyclops get, gets what's coming to him. And at the end of the day, that's what the story is about. What's interesting, if I may interrupt, is that when you present that view, you do so in a kind of broken English almost. Cyclops good guy. <laughs> A Cyclops, bad guy, Odysseus, good guy. Do people talk that way, or is you just trying to make the view look stupid? <laughs> I think the Cyclops talks like that, you know. Okay. Yeah. Cyclops make cheese. <laughs> so be along those lines. It's a right? cottage industry. Right, right. So and so what um Seagull seems to be suggesting here is that Homer drops in these these descriptions of the Cyclops in their land that uh, might suggest that the the gods have a particular kind of favor on the Cyclops. They're religious people, right? Yes. The, the quote, they trust to the immortal gods and they get grain and grapes from their untilled lands. Right. We'll look at this in a little bit, but there's I, there's also a sense that the island of the Cyclops is described as a kind of undefiled golden age state of pure nature. Yes, it's the noble savage. I think we should pick up on that later as well. Yeah, absolutely. That concept. Right. So I'm, I'm very intrigued by this idea that Odysseus and his men stumbling upon this island is a kind of tragedy in itself. They bring a kind of brutal kind of civilization to the island and the, the Cyclops. I mean, there's no there's no getting around the fact that the Cyclops, uh, that Polyphemus is a brutal beast. After all, he's a cannibal. He is a he is, well, People I'm, shouldn't be eating one another. Well, is a Cyclops a person? Is a Cyclops even human? Well, that's a really good question because when I discuss this episode with my students, some of them don't like Odysseus and they're very squeamish about the treatment the Cyclops uh, receives. And yeah. I just tried to make the point, a little bit of a Cyclops advocate, I guess, that 
we don't have to treat him nicely. He's not a human being. He's a monster. Monsters ah. like the Minotaur. Monsters are to be killed. Yes. Full stop. Right, right. Yeah. At the same time, I think there are a number of scenes in Book Nine where I think Homer at least turns towards a kind of sympathy for the Cyclops that I think you, you would not see in, a um, say, an account of Theseus and the Minotaur. I just think that's really interesting. Okay. Yeah. So what are we going to give the viewers today, the listeners, I mean, to say? Well, I think we're, we're going to extend upon what we were just talking about. We're going to get into the weeds of the complicated nature of the morality of this particular scene. I think we're going to, uh, hopefully by the end of this, the listener will see that it's a much more complicated, a much more messy uh, kind of story than Odysseus, good guy, Cyclops, bad. Yeah, but you, you scholars, you intellectuals, you're always trying to complicate stuff. But that's our job. Well, can't we just keep it simple? But this is not simple stuff. Odysseus is the hero. The Cyclops is a... A uh, bloodthirsty, man-eating, bone-crunching monster. So kill him. Yeah. Well, wh- why can't it be both? Why can't uh, it be both? Right? All right. All right. So is it the victory of the clever hero over the barbaric monster? What moral systems are at play here? And, of course, the big one, the X word, Zinnia. Zinnia, Or yes. the C word. Do the laws of Zinnia apply? Right. I think that's, if there's anything that's close to kind of a skeleton key for kind of understanding this episode, um, it's that. Okay. Yep. So as we start in on book nine, mm-hmm. which is the exclusive focus of today's episode, yes. we're going to catch the listener up on one through eight in lightning speed. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Faster so, than Odysseus can cross the Mediterranean, which took a while. <laughs> we're going to summarize books one through eight. Yes. Go for it, Winkle. All right. So Odysseus has been Calypso's Island for seven years. Ogigia. Uh, Ogigia. In the last episode, we talked about how the gods come down and demand that Calypso let him go. He builds a raft, which falls apart. He washes up on Phaeacia, uh, where he's taken in as an honored guest. He meets Nausicaa, the princess, who's yes. doing the laundry along the shore. She has parents, Alcinous and Arte. Odysseus is, is taken in. He's uh, made to look a lot prettier by Athena. Um, he's uh, he's feted with, with games, with food. Busts out some lawn jarts. Lawn jarts. Shows uh, the old man can still compete in the discus. He can, he can hang. Um, and then Demodocus starts singing songs, and um, he, Odysseus starts weeping. And then finally, finally, the Phaeacians sit him down and say, Okay, stranger, you have benefited from all of our hospitality, and now it's time for us to learn who you are. Yes. Who are you? That's right. And then he drops his grout fit. He, he, he drops it. Wait, there's grout? No, no, no. His grout fit. His grout? I have no idea what you're you talking about. You know what a about? grout fit is? No. How old are you, Winkle? Well, I, I, mean, I just came from a f- so, folk moot. <laughs> so a grout fit... A grout fit is a monochromatic outfit. It's a gray outfit, a grout fit. So it's like an outfit that's like the color of grout? No, no. You take the word gray. Oh. Aren't you some kind of student of language, teacher of language? I used to be. You take the word gray and take the word outfit and oh. shove them together in a portmanteau, you've got grout fit. I was too focused on the grout part, you know, the little thing between yeah, the tiles. Yeah, 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 I know, yeah. I know. Yeah, all right, all right. All right, these are the kinds of things the kids are saying these days. So fit. coming to school, nice, nice grout foot, Jimmy. <laughs> is, that, is that what's going on? It's not a grout foot. You can barely say it. <laughs> All right, so Odysseus, he drops, what, he's getting naked again? No, 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 no. He sloughs off the disguise he's been wearing, right? Oh, okay, I got you. He he sloughs off this disguise, I'm just a nobody, basically. Yeah. And he says, this is my story. Right. Who I am, who I really am, and how I got here. Gotcha. Now I I get the connection. We together on this? We are together, right. Okay, so then books 9 through 12... They constitute a connected whole, a set, kind of like books one through four, the Telemachia. Yes. Exploits of Telemachus, books nine through 12, the exploits of Odysseus. Right. And this is where we get all the uh, kind of the fantastical adventures, right? Well, arguably the most popular and most famous part of this book. Yes. Many people skip lots of the other parts because they just want the story of the Cyclopes, the Lotus Eaters, and all that kind of you stuff. You sound a little bitter. About, about I the, am a little bitter. The way you said cyclopedia. It's, kind of, <laughs> it's kind of similar to what Ovid said about the Aeneid, which is everyone reads book four, the Dido. Aeneas and Dido's yeah. arms, and they throw away the rest. It's like they want to get to the chorus, right? They don't want the verse. They don't want the bridge. Just yeah, I guess that's how Don't bore how it us. Is. Get to the chorus. Right? You know the, uh, the wonderful song by Don Henley? The Heart of the Matter, isn't that what it's yeah, called? Yeah, it's a wonderful song, yes. Yeah, so on the radio, they always cut out that little bridge oh, I, before I hate, they get the chorus. That bridge is great. It and is. And it irritates me every time they do that. You can hear there's a panning of the uh, guitar acoustic back back and forth. The acoustic guitar pans yes. a little bit. Yes. They but chop that out. They chop it off so they can squeeze in another ad. Yeah, that's yeah. the equivalent of what happens in the Odyssey. Just exactly go to right. book nine. 
Right. And for our listeners, one of the reasons that we're focusing, zooming in on book nine just for this episode is that it's it's really the only one of those 10 or 11 adventures that they have in these books that basically gets its own book. It's the longest, it's the most extended uh, adventure of these. And so this would be, you know, included with Circe and Scylla and Charybdis and, and the Lotus Eaters and the Sirens, the Cyclops. The Cattle of Apollo is yes. in there as well. Yes, exactly. But the Cyclops gets more or less its own book. All right, we got to get into book nine. And Dave, I think you're going to start us off by with a, reading a little Greek, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. So here we go. The first few lines of book nine. Ton dapame bamanos prasefe palume tisadusios. Al kinoe crayon panton aridekita laon. Etoi men tada kalon akuemen estina oidu. Toyud hoyos hodesti the ois and a linki asaudain. Very nice. Do you want to translate for that for us? Or? How about you give us a little bit of the Lombardo there? Can you do that? Yes, let's go to it. So Lombardo translates thusly. And Odysseus, his great mind teeming. My lord, Elcinous, what could be finer than listening to a singer of tales such as Demodocus with a voice like a god's? Nothing we do is sweeter than this. A cheerful gathering of all the people sitting side by side throughout the halls, feasting and listening to a singer of tales. Yeah, I like that so much. Yeah. The adjective that he's looking at there is palumatus. Uh, we had palutropon, remember, at the very beginning of the whole entire epic. The man of many turns. Yes, the yes. versatile guy. And now, uh, as he develops character, Homer uses another adjective, palumatus, the guy of many minds. He has a versatility of thought. Right. And those two adjectives are, are fairly close to, to one another, right? Absolutely. Uh, but um, yeah, One has more to do with activity, yes. palutropon. The other has to do with the scheming and cunning. Exactly right. Exactly right. We were talking in the last episode about how Demodocus might be a thinly veiled disguise for Homer himself. And the way that Demodocus is described here with a voice like a god's. Right. And nothing is finer than sitting in front of a guy like that and listening, yeah. right? It's so the best thing you can do. Throw away compliments you know, <laughs> directed at oneself. It's great. It's great. It's very sweet. Later on, then, we have uh, Odysseus setting aside his literary grout fit and saying, I am Odysseus, great Laertes' son, known for my cunning throughout the world, and my fame reaches even to heaven. My native land is Ithaca, a sunlit island with a forested peak called Neraton, visible for miles. Right. It's the privilege of a hero to boast, right? He's monologuing. Uh, he's, he's monologuing, right. And again, in the previous books, this has been proven that his fame has preceded him. One of Demodocus' songs was about Odysseus. Mm -hmm. right? So his fame has preceded him, and now he says, hey, I'm the real deal standing right here. And it's really interesting that he identifies himself like this now because very soon when we get to the Cyclops episode, it is his refusal to keep his mouth shut yes. in the face of, you know, a threat that gets him into all the trouble. Exactly right, which is a very common downfall for kind of the trickster archetypal hero. Mm -hmm. They can't stand not taking credit. Yes, anonymity is not an option. So right after the Trojan War, Odysseus' and his men make a short hop across the Hellespont and they come to the land of the Cicones where they go on a raiding party. I, I think one of the interesting things that we see with Odysseus' and his men, how they kind of stay in war mode even after the war is over. Mm. And I think it's also kind of striking how, in some ways, how badly this raid goes. He says he pillages the town, he kills all the men, he divides up the the, uh, the spoils and the women, but his men want to hang around and party. They want to slaughter the sheep and the cattle, even though Odysseus says it's time to go. And I think that's an obvious foreshadowing of what ultimately spells the end of his men when they eat the cattle of, the, of, of Helios. Right. And it's the after effects of war. Ten years of pillaging and raiding and fighting on the shores of Troy, the war's over they have to transition into a different way of thinking. Right. I guess this would be called PTSD. It's exactly in some what ways. I was thinking. Exactly. You cannot right. get out of the war mindset, so I'm told. Right, right. And so from there, they, the first kind of fantastical adventure that they have is with the, these um, people called the Lotus Eaters. And so this is where his men go on shore. They're tempted to eat this, this lotus flower, and they discover that once they eat the lotus flower, they don't want to do anything else but stay and eat the lotus flower. And this just has to drag his men away to continue on their journey. Jeff, can you read us a little bit of that lotus eater episode? My pleasure. Again, Lombardo. We went ashore, and the crews lost no time in drawing water and preparing a meal beside their ships. After they had filled up on food and drink, I sent out a team, two picked men and a herald to reconnoiter and sound out the locals. They headed out and made contact with the lotus eaters, who meant no harm, but did give my men some lotus to eat. Whoever ate that sweet fruit lost the will to report back, preferring instead to stay there munching lotus, oblivious of home. 
I hauled them back, wailing to the ships, bound them under the benches, and then ordered all hands to board their ships on the double before anyone else tasted the lotus. Hmm. So this is some powerful sort of a potion that, that keeps them there and takes away all of their desire to work and yeah. so forth? Yeah, no, what's interesting is this, this land of the Lotus Eaters later becomes to be associated with an island that's called Jeriba or De Jeriba off the coast of Tunisia, which I had the privilege of, of, of going to a number of years ago. Looking and for lotus? Looking for lotus, but as I learned, one of the things that island was famous for was its production of the poppy. Oh, is that the leading theory that this is a kind of an opiate? Exactly right. The Den of the Lotus Eaters, Odysseus says, they didn't mean any harm. They just wanted to share the lotus. It's kind of a, an opium den where you just want to sit around and, and um, yeah, take the drug. So they get out of there because Odysseus manhandles them, takes them on board, ties them down, and they churn the foam blue sea and off they go. And off they go. And the next stop is the Cyclops Island. Yes. And we came to the land of the Cyclopes, says Lombardo. Lawless savages who leave everything up to the gods. These people neither plow nor plant, but everything grows for them unsown. Wheat, barley, and vines that bear clusters of grapes, watered by rain from Zeus. They have no assemblies or laws, but live in high mountain caves, ruling their own children and wives and ignoring each other. I think this is, uh, takes me back to the Charles Siegel quote. There's a tension there. On the one hand, this is they're lawless savages. Um, they ignore each other. They're uncivilized. But at the same time, they live in a golden age type of island that kind of gives them everything they need kind of of its own accord. It seems to me that this is a really sophisticated portrayal. The complication that you were after, the complexifying oh, you're, coming, you're coming around to it now. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> and what I don't like is when scholars look to make things complicated. If the, if the artist, the poet, I'm on the side of the artist. Yes. If the artist presents it with complexity, then so be it. Right. I think one of the most overused words today is, is problematic. Problematic. Right? It drives me crazy. But I think there is, there is some complication here that I think doesn't often get the attention it deserves. I was reading in the newspaper yesterday about neologisms, a very excellent article. I think it was the Wall Street Journal. And the author said that Thomas Kuhn, who wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, mm-hmm. he was the one responsible for coining the phrase paradigm shift. Oh, really? And he, he rused the day that he came up with it because <laughs> it is now so overused. Yes. The use of paradigm shift has become problematic. Yes, as is the use of the term grout fit. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think I'm good with grout fit. Okay. <laughs> So these people neither plow nor plant. Yes. So no agriculture, no. right? They're lawless savages. What makes them savage? No law. You've got to have a folk moot. You've got to get together and decide who's the basileus, who's the king. Right. It's not chaos in the vomitorium because we have a clear hierarchy established here. <laughs> Don't we, Winkle? As far as you know. Okay. Yeah. Everything and, grows for them unsown. Yes. And then uh, he goes on to say that they, uh, they're also isolated. They isolate from one another, right? So that's a very, that's very un-Greek. It is. Right? They're anti-Greeks because every Greek city, as we know, at least in the historical period, every Greek city has an assembly, mm-hmm. right? A, a marketplace yes. for the exchange of goods and ideas. It has a stadium. you got to have athletics. And finally, it has some place of worship, right? A temple. Right. And usually a theater. Exactly right. Yes. Humans are political animals. Correct. And but not these cyclopes. No. So they deserve to die. <laughs> That's all there is to it. You, well, you, the pendulum seems to have kind of swung back for you. They, well, they, <laughs> Odysseus, good. Cyclops, bad. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. No assemblies or laws, but they live in high mountain caves, ruling their own children and wives. There's a little bit of a sense of violence there, isn't mm-hmm. there? Exactly. And where do these Cyclops wives come from? Where do their wives come from? Has yes. It, is that ever answered? No. No. <laughs> no. How, how do they, you know, contract marriage relationships if there's no assembly point? Oh, good point, right. I don't understand never that. Just, it could, could it simply be that Odysseus is wrong about this? I mean, in I mean, his description? In his, well, I mean, so he's, he's not much of an ethnographer is what you're saying. Exactly right. And we alluded to this, to this in a previous episode. Odysseus has become our principal narrator now. It's not Homer anymore. But we right? don't know what to trust. What do, what do we trust, right? So he's, is he slanting the narrative in a way that is problematic? Yes. <laughs> well, could be. So Lombardo goes on. We're long about line 115. You want to read a little bit of that just to continue setting the stage? Sure. So he describes the, uh, the island itself. A fertile island slants across the harbor's mouth. 
neither very close nor far from the Cyclops shore. It is well wooded and populated with innumerable wild goats, uninhibited by human traffic. Not even hunters go there. Trapping through the woods and roughing it on the mountainsides, it pastures no flocks, has no tilled field, unplowed, unsown, virgin forever, bereft of all men. All it does is support those bleating goats. The Cyclopes do not sail and have no craftsmen to build them benched, red-proud ships that could supply all their wants, crossing the sea to other cities, visiting each other as, as other men do. These same craftsmen would have made this island into a good settlement. It's not a bad place at all, and would bear everything in season. Meadows lie by the seashore, lush and soft, where vines would thrive. So he goes, he's, he's kind of taking the Cyclops to task, is that there's this nearby island that'd be great for a condo yes. and a golf course. They haven't developed any of the natural resources. Right, exactly, right. No ships where, where you could go visit each other. Craftsmen would make this into a paradise, but they have left it, these savage, lawless, unassembled Cyclopes, they have left it pristine. Yes, exactly. That's not Greek. It's not Greek, right. No, you've got to take the natural environment and shape it to the benefit of your fellow man and woman. At the same time, I think there's a little echo of Hesiod in there that Homer's saying is that golden age when everything was perfect, when man and nature were, were living as one and, and gods and humans mingled together without any problems. That's There's a little bit of a echo here. Well, in addition to the obvious anachronism of saying that Homer is echoing Hesiod, who came <laughs> after, my other problem... can't pro- prove that. <laughs> <laughs> my other problem is... Uh, those easy hit episodes have not been very well listened to. <laughs> so we don't want any echoes of easy hit. We here. do not. Okay, all right, all right, fair enough. Theogony and the ecstasy. Who comes up with that stuff? <laughs> it's an excellent episode, listeners. Check it out. So the question comes down to this what's better, civilization or a kind of pristine state which could be described as savagery? Yeah, exactly. Or maybe somewhere in the middle. I think one way to read this this episode is that Odysseus and men represent you know, a kind of a civilization gone wrong. We've just read about them pillaging and destroying and killing. And Homer's just interested in kind of winding up these two sides and letting them smash into each other. So they're on the island. They spend part of the day hunting, Mm -hmm. finding food and meat and so forth. And then Odysseus says to his crew, the rest of you will stay here while I go with my ship and crew on reconnaissance. I want to find out what those men are like. Wild savages with no sense of right or wrong or hospitable folk who fear the gods. And we'll find out what kind of men they are after the break. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Odd Ostra Coffee Roasters of Hillsdale, Michigan. This is our third week of welcoming this wonderful sponsor. How do you like their coffee, Jeff? It's so good. It's so good. We got a shipment um, uh, this week at our household, and the last few days we've been brewing it up every morning. It's it's exquisite. It's They've just... got light roast, dark roast, and everything in between. Yes, and they have this poetry series right now where each bag has a famous poem from a wonderful poet on the side. They did some words worth this morning. Right, yeah. Um, but the beans inside themselves are a poetry all its own. Absolutely. Lyricism in a cup. I brewed some up this morning. Really delicious. Uh, It's such a a joy not only to promote them, but to get to enjoy the product. Indeed, indeed. The the delicious coffee beans. So how can the Ad Nauseam listeners get some of this magic? All you have to do, listener, is go to adastraroasters.com. You want to spell that just in case? And not everyone knows Latin. Ad Astra is A-D-A-S-T-R-A roasters.com. And go to the website and put what what you want in the checkout. Type in A-N-A-A in the coupon code box and get 10% off. So that's four Latin words together for the coupon code. Yes. Ad nauseum, ad astra. Ad astra. Right. right. And then the coffee will arrive on their doorstep. They have a monthly promotional. You can have a subscription service. Really delicious coffee. Goes very well with a book like The Odyssey. Indeed. Great stuff. So this episode is also brought to you by Racial Coffee. You get your beans in the mail from Odd Ostra. You settle down into your easy chair. You're ready to read the Odyssey or something like that. But wait, your beans haven't been brewed. What are you going to do? Well, the only thing that you really can do is to uh, use some of the fine brewing equipment offered by Ratio Coffee from Portland, Oregon to get the job done. So you could use, say, the Ratio 6, black stainless steel or white beautiful machine, heats the water up exquisitely, sends it down through the Fibonacci shower head, off gases all those harsh flavors, and then down into the carafe. Delicious, right? Delicious, right. And the machines themselves are absolute works of art. And Ratio Coffee offers the uh, the Ratio 6 and also the Ratio 8. Two beautiful machines. Yes, uh, veritable titans of home coffee brewing, you might yes. say. Yes. 
And what can the uh, Ad Nauseam listener do to score one of these lovely machines? Well, our listeners can get a direct-to-consumer discount by going to RatioCoffee.com and entering our special code ANCO. And by doing so, you get 15% off the Ratio 6 machine. 15%? 15! Yes, between now and March 20, 2021. So they need to go to RatioCoffee.com, yes. R-A-T-I-O Coffee.com, enter the code ANCO, A-N-C-O, and get 15% off. This episode of Ad Nauseam is also brought to you by Hackett Publishing. Since 1972, Hackett has been an independent publisher of high-quality translations in the field of classics. Yes, Dave, Hackett's growing classics list includes hundreds of titles covering ancient history, literature, philosophy, political science, and classical language study. Jeff, their classical lit catalog is loaded. Iliad, Odyssey, Aeneid, Metamorphoses, all these great things. Hackett has titles on Ancient Rome too, translations of Suetonius, Livy, and much more. Yes, all those historians. I especially love the Hans Orberg series, the Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata, Roma in Italia Est, Italia in Europa Est, and so forth. <laughs> so what should the listener do? Well, uh, Ian Crew, you can save 20% on any order and receive free shipping from Hackett Publishing. All you have to do is go to hackettpublishing.com, find the text you want, and enter AN2021, AN2021 in the box, which asks for the coupon code. Don't hesitate. Check out hackupublishing.com today. So these dwellers of Cyclops Island, lawless savages or hospitable? What does Odysseus find out? Well, Odysseus, he, he, he makes a very bad move. He even admits he makes a bad move at the beginning. So he and, his, and a handful of his men, they come to the cave, uh, whoever owns the cave is out uh, working in the fields. And his men say, hey, let's, uh, there's a bunch of cheese here. There's some sheep. Let's grab some, get it back on the boat, and let's get out of here. Yeah. So Lombardo here, along, along about line 210, there were crates stuffed with cheese and pens crammed with lambs. There was lamb cramming and lamb kids, cramming. <laughs> firstlings, middlings, and newborns in separate sections. The vessels he used for milking, pails and bowls of good workmanship, were brimming with whey. My men thought we should make off with some cheese. So now this this seems pretty civilized to me. No, 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 Winkle. You are confusing ordered self-interest with civilization. Well, certainly that's, that's a part of civilization, isn't it? Yeah, but it's not enough. It's a necessary but insufficient condition, the philosophers would say. So you've got to order your self-interest right. But true civilization means caring for others as well. Yeah, but what about the cheese? <laughs> well, this is, you know, this cheese is really starting to grate on me. But oh, this is why the Cyclopes are not civilized. Because you could take care of your lambs and put them in their separate little lamb crates and yeah. order all your cheese properly. But they don't care about one another. There's no assembly, there's no laws, there's no literature, there's no conversation. There's no There's no even sharing of the cheese. No. Okay. No, there's not a fondue. It's, there's no fondue night among the uh, the Cyclopes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what fondue is? Of course I do. It's, it's melted cheese, you're dipping things, it's good right. stuff, right. We were uh, children when the fondue craze hit the United States. It's long since petered out, I yeah, believe. I believe so. I, I can't tell you the last time I had any fondue. Do you guys have a fondue pot? We do actually do have a fondue pot. Yeah, so but we, we never break it out, though. Maybe we should bring it into the vomitorium sometime. That sounds delightful. Okay. Yeah. I wonder if there could be like a virtual fondue. A vir- really? A- vir- and listeners all over the world, we get together for fondue night. Uh, a virtual fondue night. Yeah, That's- and prove that we're not cyclopes. That sounds great. Because yeah. there's lots of cheese, but the cyclopses is... They don't have any actual civilization because of the isolation. Gotcha. So he's just he's dipping into the fondue pot just on his own. That's right. It's lonely. It's kind of pathetic. Right, so now his men, they want to take the stuff and get out of there, which even this is himself uh, admits now was, was probably the right move. But as Lombardo translates here, Odysseus says, it would have been far better if I, if I had listened to my men. But I wanted to see him, whoever this, this cave dweller is, and see if he would give me a gift of hospitality. And when he did come, he was not a welcome sight. So I think this is interesting. That, you know, why would Odysseus assume um, you know, this guy living in a cave, uh, isolated with his cheese, would play by the rules of Zinnia. Yes, Zinnia, guest friendship, hospitality, a certain, just to review, a certain number of things are due to a guest, a warm place to sit, a food, drink, conversation, the basics of human interaction and interchange. Right, and, and a key element of the civilization that Odysseus is describing in prizes here. Well, definitely, and it's what's wrong with his own home. He doesn't know this yet, but the suitors are eating Penelope and Telemachus out of house and home. They're behaving right. as very bad guests. Yeah. So can Odysseus get a gift so from... Don't you think he's, he's a bit naive here? 
he admits a mistake here, but it's ridiculous for him to expect that these rules would be at play, given what he's already said about the island and how he described it and what he saw and what he assumes. In its undeveloped state, you mean, the, the primitiveness yes. of it. Right. Well, that's fair. That's fair. And so, and he gets himself and his men into immediate hot water because of this mistake. Yes. So now they're in the cave, Odysseus and a few men, and he says, we lit a fire, Lombardo again, and offered sacrifice and helped ourselves to some of the cheese. Then we sat and waited in the cave until he came back, herding his flocks. Now, the feta that they serve in Greece, most of it is uh, sheep's milk cheese, right? That's right. And it's very delicious. Harkens right back to this episode. Yes, excellent. Yes. He carried a huge load of dry wood to make a fire for his supper and heaved it down with a crash inside the cave. We were terrified and scurried back into a corner. He drove his fat flocks into the wide cavern, at least those that he milked, leaving the males, the rams, and the goats outside in the yard. This is the part that uh, becomes really problematic for Odysseus. Then he lifted up a great door stone, a huge slab of rock, and set it in place. Twenty sturdy wagons couldn't pry it from the ground. That's how big the stone was he set in the doorway. Then he sat down and milked the ewes and bleeding goats all in good order and put the sucklings beneath their mothers. I know, Winkle, you're going to say he's civilized, right, just because he knows how to take care of animals? This, uh, animal husbandry. It's, all right. it's a key piece of civilization. Half yeah. of the white milk he curdled and scooped into wicker baskets. The other half he let stand in the pail so he could drink it later for his supper. He worked quickly to finish his chores, and as he was lighting the fire, he saw us and said... He said, Who are you strangers? Sailing the seas, huh? Where from and what for? Pirates, probably. Roaming around causing people trouble. And after screwing up his courage, Odysseus does find he can make a reply, even though he's scared. And he says, basically, we're Greeks, but he calls upon Zeus Xenios, the Zeus who guards hospitality in particular. So at the end, he says, the end of his little speech, we are your suppliants. And Zeus avenges strangers and suppliants, Zeus god of strangers who walks at their side. You get the impression that Odysseus is in a state of panic here. Exactly. And he, he abandons self-reliance and cites the gods. Right. And my sense of the kind of the tone of the scene here is Odysseus doesn't think he's going to get a gift anymore. No, no. He's, he's desperate to throw a card on the table that's going to help, that's going to work. Definitely. Right? And Odysseus doesn't strike me as, I'm not sure about this notion, but I want to, I want to give it a, a chance here. He doesn't strike me as a particularly religious man on the whole. No. He worships Athena because she helps him. But on the whole, he doesn't seem especially interested in what the gods think. No. When the gods can help him, he's, he's fine with last week with the white goddess. Even he pushes the goddess away, then reluctantly accepts her help. Now, I want to point out here that uh, I think Homer deliberately juxtaposes the Cyclops episode with the, the, the island of the Phaeacians. We get these two radically different views of Xenia. And you know, the Phaeacians do it to a T, you know, hyper, hyper Xenos, and uh, the Cyclops is completely without it. And I think another way that Homer drives us home is that the very first question that the Cyclops asked them, who are you, is more or less the last question that the Phaeacians asked. You, know, you give all the gifts. You give your guests dinner. You allow them to rest before you ask them who they are. And we get the reverse order on the Cyclops Island. That's very interesting. So there's a sharp contrast yes. then between the extended Xenia and the, the savagery of the Cyclops right. in the and cave. He, and, and Homer can set up that really nice contrast by organizing the narrative as he does with these flashbacks. Mm -hmm. So the Cyclops episode has happened before the Phaeacians, but he can put them right next to each other uh, with this more complex uh, storytelling. Right. So then how does Odysseus uh, receive the answer from the Cyclops? The Cyclops says, you're dumb stranger or from far away. If you ask me to fear the gods, Cyclopes don't care about Zeus or his Aegis or the blessed gods since we are much stronger. Now, this is hubris, of course, Yes. but nobody cares about the Cyclopes and their sorry excuse for a civilization, so they can get away with things like this. Exactly right. Yeah. Although Homer did tell us that their island is Zeus-watered, but they are kind of outside of that circle of civilization. So is the Cyclops going to spare them? Uh, he's not going to spare them. He's going to eat them. The Cyclops then asks Odysseus some very pointed questions about the location of his ship and about his identity generally. Odysseus doesn't fall for it. He doesn't fall for it. A Cyclops, he, I mean, he's not the most subtle individual. You know, he goes, hey, where, where'd you park your ship? You know, I'm just, I'm just curious, want to know. And Odysseus, uh, he's not going to fall for it. And he tells him that Poseidon destroyed their ships and the, the ships are all gone and they've washed up on shore. Yeah, yet another lie. Yep. But of course, a lie that you tell to an enemy. So there's no problem with that. Exactly right. 
But this lie doesn't really help Odysseus in the moment because Polyphemus, the Cyclops, he'll have none of it. This brought no response, the translation says, from his pitiless heart, but a sudden assault upon my men. His hands reached out, seized two of them, and smashed them to the ground like puppies. Their brains spattered out and oozed in the dirt. He tore them limb from limb to make his supper, gulping them down. Now we get a very nice epic simile. Mm. Like a mountain lion, leaving nothing behind, guts, flesh, or marrowy bones. Ooh, gruesome. That, that is some, that's some pretty gruesome lines there. Yeah, yeah. And now that the true character of Polyphemus is revealed, this creature... Odysseus and his companions have a real problem. They do. So every time that the Cyclops goes out with his flocks, he shuts the door. He puts the door stone that takes, what was it, 20 wagons to, yes. to move this thing? Not and, even 20 wagons could dislodge it. It's so massive. Exactly right. And when the Cyclops comes back, you know, if the Cyclops falls asleep, they can't kill the Cyclops because then everybody's trapped in there for good. So they have to find a way to get out without killing the Cyclops. Now, and, they could kill him. There are enough of them, and Odysseus is enough of a hero but they then can't move the rock, right. obviously, just to restate it. Yeah, they're, just, so, they're so, trapped. So what do they light on? What is their, their final solution? Odysseus' idea is that uh, he finds an olive wood stake uh, in the cave, and he decides he's going to sharpen it, and when the Cyclops falls asleep, they're going to blind the Cyclops. And in the hopes that he, in his blindness, he will still open the door to let his sheep out, and the men can slip out uh, with them. So when the Cyclops had filled his huge belly with human flesh... You still think they're civilized, Winkle? And the, then, it, it's getting less and less civilized. Okay. But I, and I, then I, washed I'm it down about the sheep, uh, right. the, the cheese. Yeah. Washed it down with milk. Odysseus thinks I'll sneak up and drive my sword into him while he's sleeping. But at the last minute, wisdom prevails, and right. he he says, like we were just saying, there's no way we can get out because right. the, the stone's too big. Right. So as soon as dawn came, streaking the sky red, this is Lombardo along about line 300, he rekindled the fire and milked his flocks, all in good order, placing the sucklings, etc., etc. His chores done, he seized two of my men and made his meal. Two at a time. So now they're down four men, yeah. supper and breakfast. Yeah, it's horrifying. So Odysseus comes up with this plan, and it involves getting the Cyclops drunk. And in a kind of a show of a kind of false hospitality all his own, Odysseus offers uh, the Cyclops this, this wine, and the Cyclops has never had wine before. And again, another signal that the Cyclops is uncivilized. There's no place for, for wine, a drink that takes a, a human kind of complicated process to, uh, to make. Yes, right? yeah, right. The, the venting and all that, it's, it's difficult, it's technical. Is it more difficult of, than cheese? A little bit of chemistry involved. Yes. It's easier for it to go wrong, I think. The Cyclops can't do it, but Odysseus has some. The Cyclops love it, and he becomes a little bit inebriated. Right. right? Gets quite intoxicated. Thankfully, there happens to be some olive wood lying nearby. And one of the things I like about this story is that the contemporary Greeks that we know, they love olives, yes. and they love everything about the olive. So the ancient mystique surrounding the olive tree and all that it gives to Greece, it's a contemporary mystique as well. Exactly. And also, not to mention, it's connection to Athena. Exactly, well. of right. course. And so the fact that it's so prominent in the story, not only here, but later on near the end... It's part of the recognition between Odysseus and Penelope. I like it yes. that the olive gets that kind of billing. That's yeah. really impressive. I like that too. I like so that he too. takes the green olive branch or the, the pike and he heats it up in the fire to harden the end of it. Now get all the moisture out, make it pointed and sharp, and then what are they going to do? Oh, they're going to jab it into his eye and talk about some gruesome lines. They're going to drill it down into his socket. There's a misunderstanding often that students have when they approach this story. They think that the word Cyclops means one-eyed. And of right. course, he does have only one eye, but that's not the etymology of the term kuklops. It's a kuklos, meaning circle, and then opes, eye, as you know. So Homer makes the point that he has one big shield of an eye. Yes. So it's, it's more the size than the fact that there's only one of them. Exactly, exactly right. If you look at early artistic renderings of the Cyclops, he's often depicted with two what seem to be closed or blinded eyes, and then with a, with one eye in the middle. A so that, third one, kind of. So there seems to be maybe there's some tradition about the Cyclops were more human at one point, and then they become uh, more monstrous with the two eyes being pla replaced with one. Definitely. Yeah. Very similar to the way that the Gorgons are yes. portrayed in early art. The Gorgons are not especially anthropomorphic. They only become 
the the beautiful kind of uh, Gorgon or Medusa as portrayed by someone like Bernini, the famous Bernini sculptor. Oh, yes, sculpture. right, right. Yeah. Highly anthropomorphic, a beautiful woman who just happens to have snaky hair. Right. That's the, that's the Gorgon. Similarly, the early Cyclopes are not human-looking at all. No. Only later do they become what we now recognize as a large person, but just happens to have one eye. One eye, exactly right. But before the gruesome blinding, there's a little more conversation, which will prove important for later events. And this, of course, is the first pun recorded in Western lit. Right. And I think in some ways it's arguably Odysseus's best trick because uh, it doesn't pay off right away. It's almost he anticipates something down the line that, you know, how could he see that coming? But he kind of pulls the pin of this pun grenade and it only goes off later. It's brilliant. So let's pull the pin here. I spoke these words to him. Cyclops, you ask me my name, my glorious name, and I will tell it to you. Remember now to give me the gift just as you promised. No man is my name. They call me no man. My mother, my father, and all my friends, too. <laughs> this, of course, is the Greek word utis. Utis, yeah. yeah. We could translate it as otis, perhaps, I suppose. Otis, right. If we wanted to make it sound better. But nomen, or no man, not just do his uh, mother and father call him that, but all his friends, too. Everybody calls him utis. Yeah, so, you know, Odysseus can't just tell a lie. He's got to tell a great lie. He's got to pull out all the stops. Exactly right. I always, I always felt that Homer misses an opportunity here because you know utis not anyone no nobody he could have been metis not someone right because me is also a negator there still any sympathy from the cyclops how does he respond to this it's getting brutal so cyclops says yeah i'll, I'll give you a gift no man and my gift is i'll, I'll eat you last ah. all right so yeah this is this is not very civilized no but then we get some of the most gruesome lines and thinking the whole epic, uh, the, the actual blinding. Can I take these? Do you yeah, mind let's take? hear this. Right. So the Cyclops, he falls asleep in his drunken stupor. Uh, Homer tells us he's belching up wine and bits of human flesh. And that's when the men swing into action. Mm, right. It's a vomitorium. In it is. A, it's an it's actual vomitorium in the cave. So picking up with Lombardo's translation, he says, When the olive wood steak was about to catch fire, green though it was and was really glowing, I took it out and brought it right up to him. My men stood around me, and some god inspired us. My men lifted up the olive wood stake and drove the sharp point right into his eye, while I, putting my weight behind it, spun it around the way a man bores a ship's beam with a drill, leaning down on it while the other men beneath him keep it spinning and spinning with a leather strap. Another epic simile right there. <laughs> That's right. Even the blinding of the Cyclops has to have an epic simile. Exactly. Compared to uh, drilling a hole in a plank on a ship. Right, right. It's a, the, it's a multiple man operation. Right, and those civilization skills of shipbuilding come in handy here. Of course. Right. That's how we twirled the fiery pointed stake in the Cyclops' eye. The blood formed a whirlpool around its searing tip. His lids and brow were all singed by the heat from the burning eyeball, and its roots crackled in the fire and hissed like an axe head or adds a smith dips into water when he wants to temper the iron. That's uh, another epic simile? Yeah, another one. Okay. Yeah, another, and again from the, the workshop. The world of civilization. Exactly you right. see, if the Cyclops had just developed their natural resources, this never would have happened. That's exactly right. I'm coming around. I'm coming around. All right. So he said, that's how his eyes sizzled and hissed around the olive wood stake. Ooh, that is some rough business right there. Yeah. He screamed, right? He, it goes on. Yes, he, he screamed, and he's very upset about it. Of course. <laughs> I don't have the lines in front of me. The rock uh, walls rang with his voice. Yes. Okay. Do you feel sorry for the Cyclops? Because I don't. Not one whit. Not one whit? No, he's uncivilized. I don't know. I mean, it gets, these guys broke into his house. Yes, but moments ago, he was eating them. He's violating Zania. He's standing his ground. Isn't that the law? You can stand your ground? Kind you, of the uh, castle doctrine? Yeah, exactly right. Right. They broke in and they just ate some cheese and they're half his size. Okay, all right. And most of all, he's a monster. And so he's got it coming. Yes. This is what you do to monsters. What did Theseus do to the Minotaur? Right, okay. What did Perseus do to Medusa? I, I'll say the Minotaur didn't make any cheese. So he's not dead. No. But he is blinded. He wrenches the stake out of his eye, all covered with blood, and now he looks for help. Uh, now he wants a civilization. Right. Yeah, exactly. He starts screaming around and uh, hoping that the other Cyclops uh, can hear him. Mm-hmm. Omer tells us they, uh, the other Cyclops heard his cry and gathered from all sides around his cave and asked him what ailed him. Polyphemus, why are you hollering so much and keeping us up the whole blessed night? Is some man stealing your flocks from you or killing you, maybe, by some kind of trick? And here the grenade of the pun referenced earlier, it goes off. Right. So Polyphemus says, no man is killing me by some kind of trick. 
They sent their words winging back to him. If no man is hurting you, then your sickness comes from Zeus. Suddenly they're very religious <laughs> and can't be helped. You should pray to your father, Lord Poseidon. Yeah, no man's hurting you. Great. Yeah. That's wonderful. Now, I think what's also significant here, this is the first time we hear the Cyclops' name. And what does this name mean? Polyphemus means much speech, many talker. Lots of different voices, chatterbox, Chatterbox, loud mouth. Mm -hmm. Right. And kind of an interesting idea that that I really like is this idea that the Cyclops, his name isn't Polyphemus because that's the name his mom and dad gave him. That's the name the Cyclops have always known him by. Is that It's not on his birth certificate. Right. That This idea that the Cyclops are so isolated, they're so uncivilized, they don't even have names. This is the first time then that he's named. Right. So when the other Cyclops are, say, Polyphemus, they're saying, whoa, hey, loudmouth, what, what, what's going on? They're not calling him because that's the name they know him by. They are actually naming him. Oh, so Odysseus brings to the island the civilization of now they have names. Now they have names. Because in an idyllic landscape, a primitive landscape, if you don't interact with anyone else, you don't need a name. Exactly right. Exactly. So now they have names. Now they have wine. Now they're talking to each other. Odysseus is bringing civilization in this in this kind of this blundering, violent kind of way. At a great cost. Yes. But don't think I'm moving closer to sympathy for this <laughs> cannibalistic monster. Yeah, okay. My only regret is that he, you know, wasn't finished off completely, like Medusa, like the Minotaur. He just lost an eye. You would rather have Polyphemus dead in the cave? Well, no, because then Odysseus and his men can't get out. Gotcha. So then the famous story of them clutching the undersides of the rams The door is open, the sheep, they go out one by one, Odysseus and his men clinging to the underside. This has been represented in comic books and paintings and drawings. It's it's a very beautiful idea. Yes. Yeah, I I think that if you were to go by even the the number of representations in ancient art, which seen from the Odyssey that even the ancients uh, themselves like the best, it's the Cyclops episode. Mm -hmm. Um, You see the, the, the blinding, you see the men on the sheep. It's all over the place. It's well represented. Can the clever trickster refrain from taking credit for this amazing accomplishment? He, he can't. And again, it's another pitfall of the trickster uh, type character. So the men get in their ships and they're trying to get out of there. The Cyclops, blinded, he's chucking rocks. He's standing on the cliff, shaking his angry fist. You right. kids get off my lawn. Exactly right. Exactly right. And Odysseus keeps yelling. And it's the episode kind of ends kind of how it began. Again, his men are telling him, stop talking. Right. Uh, you know, he can, if he can hear us, he can aim better. But Odysseus doesn't listen. Once again, just at the beginning, he says, "Let's." Grab, the men said, "Let's grab some cheese. Let's get out of here." He says, yeah. No, no. I want my. I want my. Uh, I my, little, my, my party favor. My glory. Yeah. yeah. I think the listeners probably familiar with some of those epic fails, right? That are on YouTube, and and I love those sports themed one. You know, in football, for example, the runner breaks free from the pack and gets way ahead, and he's within ten yards yes. of the goal line, and he's showboating, and his arms are outstretched, and he can see the glory and meanwhile <laughs> he can't see the individual that's sneaking up behind him to right? smack the ball out of his exactly head. at the right. last minute and he <laughs> just can't um you know the nfl made this at one point uh, a penalty excessive celebration yeah, yeah 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 odysseus would be drummed out of the league oh yeah that's, in an instant that's a perfect image for yeah. this right but i i don't like that excessive celebration is what you do if there's a great accomplishment but here it's going to come back to bite odysseus for seven years. Not just Odysseus, it's, it's really responsible for all his men well, that's true. being dead. But we don't really care about them because this is not the Aeneid. Right. He's the one that matters. He's the one that matters. The, the men are kind of cannon fodder. Definitely. Right. So Odysseus says, he ignores his men and he yells out, says, Cyclops, if anyone, any mortal man ask you how you got your eye put out, tell him that Odysseus the marauder did it, son of Laertes, whose home is on Ithaca. This is like a business card, <laughs> exactly. isn't it? <laughs> tells him his name. His tells father's his name. Father's name. He gives him his address. Right. Right, exactly. Of course, there's many people uh, that have the same name. And so the patronymic, right, Laertides, the son of Laertes, that just, that's the identifier. That's the specified complexity. I know 10 or 15 Odysseuses, but there's only one whose father is Laertes. Right. On Ithaca. Exactly. And this is all the information that the Cyclops needs now. The rule of curses. If you know somebody's real identity and name, you can call down a potent curse on them. And so that's when Odysseus raises up a prayer to his father. Odysseus, Poseidon. don't you mean Polyphemus? Polyphemus, sorry. Right. Uh, raises up the prayer to uh, his father Poseidon and says, hear me, father. Yeah, I got that quote in my Cyclops voice. Oh, please do. I want to hear, hear me, it. Poseidon, blue-named earth holder. <laughs> if you are the father you claim to be... Grant that Odysseus, son of Laertes, may never reach his home on Ithaca. 
But if he is fated to see his family again and return to his home and own native land, may he come late, having lost all his companions in another ship and find trouble at home. And of course, that's exactly what happens. Yeah, the Polyphemus is like a prophet. Right. At the beginning of the epic, we learn that indeed uh, Odysseus is fated to get home, Zeus is behind it, Athena's behind it, but here's where the curse can work. It says that from getting to point A, from point A to point B, lots of terrible things can happen, and that's where the curse comes into play. So that just about wraps this up. we got to get out of here. We share the space with a number of different uh, groups that rent here in the Vomitorium. Who's, who's coming in today? Well, they're already gathering in the lobby out there. Uh, today it's the tri-state bagpipe enthusiast coterie that needs the space. Oh, so, so they get together and they go all kilt pipe on the place? No, they just sit intently and fervently enthuse about bagpipes. Really? Yeah, that's it. And we got to get out. Okay, so yeah. we're going to yield the space to them. Uh, we want to... Remind you, uh, dear listener, please subscribe, leave a review on your favorite podcast site. Uh, This would be places like Spotify and Apple iTunes and Podbean also. You can send us feedback. You can send criticisms and rebukes to Jeff at adnauseum.com with a V. With a V. Or you can write uh, with uh, mainly criticisms to Dave at Dave at adnauseum.com with a V. With two Vs, I'd like to point out. Two Vs, that's right. That's exactly right, yeah. And we want to say thanks to our wonderful audio engineer, Ms. Mishka. She yes. She puts without this whom, together. With, without whom this podcast would not be. That's right. Yep. Yeah. And what are we talking about next week? Next week, we're going to continue on in the Odyssey with book 10 and 11. We're yes. going to talk about books 10 and 11. We're going to talk about Circe and what happened to Odysseus's men when they arrived there. Some terrible, terrible things. Yes. Now, uh, looking ahead, we have a couple of guest hosts coming up, right? Yes, we do. We were so glad to have Gary Schmidt with us last week. And coming up, we have Dr. Susan Wise Bauer, famous pedagogue. She's going to talk to us about whether history has any use, and Mm -hmm. if so, what is it? And also Dr. Ed Watts, who's an ancient historian from uh, UC San Diego, and he wrote a wonderful book called The Mortal Republic. The End of Rome. The End of Rome, the, the Death of the Republic. Very interesting. All right. We got to go, though. Dave, you got the gustatory parting shot this week, right? I do. I really like this. This is from Mitch Hedberg. He says, I like rice. Rice is great if you're hungry and want 2,000 of something. (laughs) Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.